right. So, um, okay. So now that we've got all of our personal connecting time, let's dig into this text. This month, we are reading Rabanus Maru, Mar, Marus. Ma, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And I welcome anyone who would like to correct me and my pronunciation. Please do. I would receive that. Um, so this gentleman was born in Germany and he was actually a contemporary of Alcuin and studied with him. I mean, that's kind of cool. Can you imagine actually studying with Alcuin, that's kind of exciting. Um, but he was a, uh, a Benedictine monk. So he studied in the Benedictine tradition. He lived within that tradition. He was a schoolmaster, a deacon, a priest, an abbot of the monastery. And he actually is a saint in the Catholic church. Um, okay. So the selection we read is a selection from the education of clergy in which he begins by laying out like, hey, this is the kind of education that if you're going to be a clergy, you need to have. And he gives 10 reasons right at the beginning um, or that kind of outline or 10 things that really outline this is what your education needs to be. And then for the rest of the excerpt that we have, he... Um, unpacks those and he spends the majority of the time from the excerpt we have talking about the liberal arts grammar law um, well grammar rhetoric dialectic he puts rhetoric second and then arithmetic geometry music and astronomy and he talks about what he sets out a definition for each and then unpacks it and just kind of discusses it. This is what it offers. This is what it does in the mind. This is what it allows us to do. So he just um, kind of exposes that and discusses that in each section. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention in um, mm -hmm. is oh, hit. I So I'm taking a introduction to scripture class right now. Um, in, at Belmont Abbey, which is a Catholic university in the Benedictine tradition. And we just finished reading um, Ve Werbum, I think is that. I have it right here. Um, no, that's not. Let's, we don't. We don't. Um, yes, De Verbum. And it's the Catholic church is teaching on what is revelation especially in um scripture and then how you're supposed to read scripture and how the harmony of scripture with the living tradition and uh, sacred tradition and sacred scripture and like the harmony of all that when i was reading this all i could think about was this document because it just sounds so much like it the way he's talking about how to read and um and the way he talks about scripture and the tradition i'm like oh my gosh i mean it just sounds so much like that. i'm like yes he's definitely a catholic man like you get, he just breathes that air it was so cool to see that connection okay i wanted to say that so um so a little overview so also um it, he is definitely talking from that very devout Catholic way of interpreting scripture, of being in scripture, of how it like informs your life um, and, and, and how you should study it. Um, and he's then applying it to like all these other things. Um, okay. Those were the main things I wanted to point out before we began. One of the questions um, that I wanted to start out with is in the selection where it's describing the selection on page 249, it, it um, Richard Gamble points out that the institution, that it was um, this, um, this time in history and the church, that um, it's this institution that painstakingly preserved the learning of antiquity against great odds in the dark ages and that required a literate clergy to fulfill its ongoing mission of prayer, study, evangelism, and worship. And I just really paused when I read that. And, I, and the question that came to me is, 
I wonder what that would have really been like to be in that position, to have the, I mean, just imagine it for a minute. You're like the only people in the entire culture that care about learning. And not only are you tasked with preserving this, but you have to educate a group of people well enough in the midst of a society and a culture that completely doesn't care, ha educate them enough in order to preserve it. And by preserving it, that doesn't mean just keep hold, protecting the books and hiding them. Like the living tradition has to be within them because he keeps going back to, and this is one of the points he makes in the introduction is that there was, um, Morris never separates knowledge from right conduct. Like the two are the same. Like you don't have a classical tradition without it also animating your being and you living it. And so I'm just like, uh, I feel like you could make a movie out of like the reality of how the weight of this, like in the dark ages, a group of 15 monks frantically trying to live this tradition and learn this tradition and preserve it and bring new clergy into it and train them and the amount of years you have to undergo this kind of training for it to really like oh, I just that really struck me I love that and I it reminds me of something that I've recently heard and maybe it was Angelina but she was saying that the monks also were persecuted, like they were killed for this extreme wanting to save and the copying down of these stories. It was a very tumultuous time for them. It was a time of persecution for them and that they sacrificed their lives in order for these classic works to be written down again. And I don't know enough about the, about history to know the ins and out of that, but even adding that on top of their inner desire. And then that, like you said, the knowledge and the right conduct they're bringing in of other monks, but also knowing like you could die for this. <clears throat> You are doing work that is I don't even have a word for it, but both brave, courageous, risky. You don't have to do this. You could just go live your normal life and sacrificial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think I I just to piggyback on what you said, Bethany, I think it's it's they believed so much that they were willing to die because the writings of the ancient philosophers are in a way a Christian tradition. It's it's a tradition, it's our tradition as Christians as well. And 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 I think it's at the, the end of at, at the end of this selection on page 254, <clears throat> where it says that um, when those who are called philosophers have in their exposition or in their writings uttered perchance some truth which agrees with our faith, we should not handle it timidly but rather take it as from its unlawful possessors and apply it to our own use. So I think that kind of, I don't know, uh, culminates what you just said, Bethany, to what this selection meant and what Angelina um, has said, mm -hmm. what the, the monks were willing to do. Yeah. It reminds me of something mm -hmm. when Callahan discusses, uh, he uses the analogy plundering the Egypt Egyptians um, that, you know, when the, the Israelites left Egypt, they plundered the Egyptians and then used those things to build the tabernacle. 
And it reminds this, what we just read reminds me of that. What is he? Because he starts out there too. Oh yeah. Um, and the number two on page 250. The second part of the paragraph, it says, and all that is found of truth and wisdom in the books of the philosophers of this world dare to be ascribed to nothing else than just to truth and wisdom. For it was not originally invented by those among whose utterances is found. It has much rather been recognized as something present from eternity. So far as wisdom and truth, which bring illumination, to all with their instruction have granted the possibility of such recognition. And um, it made me think of this other line in this, the book that we're reading for the scripture class. And he says about um, here, yes, here it says, in other words, God not only communicates through the words of scripture, but since he is the creator and Lord of history, oh no, it's above that, he says, that God is the author of Holy Scripture should be acknowledged, and he has the power not only of adapting words to signify things, which human writers can also do, but of adapting things themselves to signify other things. In other words, God only communicates through the, not only communicates through the words of Scripture, but since he is the creator and the Lord of history, he gives special meaning to things, people, and events mentioned in scripture and uses them as signs to tell us something about his plan of salvation and it made me think uh oh yeah go ahead <laughs> it made me think of like the idea of an archetype because one of the things i've been obsessed with lately <laughs> and i've been like going everywhere i'm like where are the original archetypes because i you know i love studying mythology i love studying symbol and there are so many diction of uh, symbol dictionaries and you know, um, different metaphors to explore. How do you know which are the original archetypes, which are the original motifs? Um, and so reading this, uh, you know, the Christian tradition would say, well, the original motifs are in scripture. That's where we get our archetypal body of knowledge, so to speak, which is exciting to think about not only God creating the world, and I mean, I know he's, he creates the essence of things, but I thought about it in a new way when I read this and then read it again in our reading for this month that, no, he creates like the inherent meaning and essence that animates a thing that, you know, the reason we even have archetypes, the reason that across all stories or most stories, dragons have a certain vibe, like he creates the vibe too. I was excited about that. <laughs> Well, it reminds me, okay, so we're taking the how to read literature class with Angelina right now, Ryan and I, and it reminds me of something that she said specifically about how it is all written in nature. Mm -hmm. So these images and everything that we're, we see in literature, that those then are communicating what is already seen out here, outside and, um, so, and even in our bodies and the processes that go through us, all of those things are then communicated in those stories and in the words. Anyway, I love that. I love everything that you just said, seeing those images. And I think that it's fascinating because it also reminds me of um, that just in Alcuin actually, Charlemagne's little um, letter where he is urging all of the um, the monks, I think he's saying, listen, and spiritual people, oh yeah, the brethren, he's basically saying you have, you need to learn outside of the scripture so that you can understand the scripture better. You need to learn those images, he says in here. For these contain images, tropes, and similar figures, and it's impossible to doubt that the reader will far arrive far more readily at the spiritual sense according as he is better instructed in learning. And then what he's saying 
along here about those same images and everything. And it's interesting to me that he, he's encouraging us to go outside of outside of the scripture in order to understand the scripture. Yeah. In order to learn those images. And I definitely feel like even with what we're learning so far I, in this class, like it definitely helps me read the Bible differently oh, and yeah. see those images where I didn't see them before. Right. I mean, Angelina is the one that taught me how to read literature as well. And um, when I went back, like I was going through a season where I wasn't reading the Bible very much. I had, well, that's a different, that's a different podcast. Um, <laughs> but um, when I came back to reading scripture, it was like blew open to me. I had spent four years just learning how to read. Well, no, it was more like two years learning how to read literature. And I came back and I was like, oh, oh, just like the connections. It was just, it was fantastic. I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's great that, I mean, it's just interesting to me. I also, my question here, it's interesting to me that we're having the same conversation that they had however many years ago. This is 776, he was born. So mid 800s, he's having these same, encouraging the church to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And we're still having that conversation now. Right. Yeah. But this is line on page 249. Morris embraces truth and wisdom wherever they are found. A generous view of secular learning characteristic also of many of the church fathers. And it seems like, and I don't know, you maybe you should answer this for us based on your historic understanding, but what made them able to not have that secular divide and for them to actually respect and want to learn from cultures outside of just their own. So that's a really better than us. Yeah, that's a really good question. So first of all, they weren't always open. There was um I pretty yeah, during shortly after Christianity was um made legal. So when Constantine becomes the first Christian emperor, now all of a sudden Christianity is legal and it's kind of the cool religion. And like when the king's a certain religion, you're like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Like, you know, like it, it becomes celebrated even to be a Christian. What that up until then, what was that? 400 something. Um, I can't remember my date exactly, but it was a lot about surviving. So the, the spaciousness to deal with all these other questions wasn't really there. So it was just about spreading the gospel, which that Christian value of spreading the gospel to all nations, I think is first. But then after Constantine became Christian, a huge debate arose about whether it was Christian or appropriate for Christians to read pagan classics. And there were strong opinions on both sides, like really strong opinions. And we see those strong opinions today. So this view was actually hard won. It was, this was not automatically the view. They had to wrestle through this. And there was very smart men that, um, that went to, took on the task of saying, no, we must read the classics and this is why and fight for that. Um, so it, it wasn't always given. Um, and so there's several thinkers and early church fathers that make arguments to that as to why we should do that. And even still, you, you see some Christians today that are like, no, I mean, uh, we knew, uh, we've come across people that are like, it's demonic to read the Chronicles of Narnia because there's a witch in it. Like there are some people who really believe that. And, um, and so we still have a very, uh, that big thing, that big space with people on both sides. Now for the people that then chose, okay, we're going in this path. We're going to embrace, uh, learning from all these different places. I think the text even here tells us is, um, where he says in part two, he says, 
And all that is found of truth and wisdom in the books of the philosophers of this world dare be ascribed to nothing else than just to truth and wisdom, for it is not originally invented by those whose utterances it is found. It is much rather being recognized as something present from eternity so far as wisdom and truth, which bring illumination to all with their instruction, have granted the possibility of such recognition. Um, and, and so there, I, what I hear in that is they're just recognizing things that are already true. And if these philosophers recognize something that is true, then we should learn from them. And they don't have the fullness of revelation. So we're going to take what we learn from them and consider it in light of the full revelation of Christ. And then that be the responsibility of the church and the faithful to do that work. Um, and that's what so many of these early church fathers was doing just in the same way as they were filtering out, like when, you know, the new Testament refers to the scripture, it's not talking about the new Testament because that wasn't the scripture yet in the sense that we have it today it was referring to the old Testament, these early church fathers, these apostles, they were like, Oh, this is this thing from the old testament oh that's this being fulfilled like they were making those connections and having those conversations and wrestling through oh this this is what jesus said and this is what it means and so they were doing that with the old testament and then we see this other thing happen with then the classical authors does that answer your question so if you want to study that more i would look up the church fathers that um are on um um in 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 involved in that battle of whether we should read classic authors the pagan authors or not well that sounds interesting something i don't have time for but interesting <laughs> yeah so anything someday you put the someday maybe and be like all right high school year 10 that will be doing that as one of our classes so really <laughs> just plan to teach what you want to learn about <laughs> idea you're I, so smart yeah <laughs> go ahead <laughs> there is nothing wrong with that no shame in my game <laughs> okay okay oh wrong wrong mouse i have too many computers all right um all right what else stood out i mean so many things I thought it was really interesting that the 10 things he listed out in the first paragraph, he said that anyone whom all this remains unknown is not able to care for his own welfare, let alone that of others. And that was like his list of this is what you need to be able to know to care for your own welfare. Let's read this, shall we? An acquaintance with Holy Scripture, the unadulterated truth of history, the derivative modes of speech, the mystical sense of words, yeah, like their meaning, like the images that that's, you know, everything we were just talking about, the advantages growing out of the separate branches of knowledge, the integrity of life that manifests itself in good morals, delicacy and good taste in oral discourse, Penetration in the explanation of doctrine, the different kinds of medicine, the various forms of disease. That's what, in his estimation, one must know to care for his own welfare and that, and then, of course, of others. What do you think of that? That is amazing. One, that it's all listed out and I've got a lot of studying to do. Two, the thing that I wrote on the side was how knowledge and love go hand in hand. Ooh, you me. both have to know in order to love, to care for yourself, to care for others, you must grow in your knowledge. And I think that the this is such... A good list. Yeah. I mean, I have nothing else to say about that. <laughs> but 
but I think that they go hand in hand. Mm. Yeah, I like that. I love like thinking about that as love and knowledge. Right, because love moves and then acts. And he builds. Oh, sorry, I forgot to turn my It's okay. Okay. Um to acquire fullness of knowledge and that they should strive after rectitude of life and perfection of thought. So the other thing I like about this is that he, before he makes the lit, this list, he says, so he's speaking of people that are going to be working in the life of the church, that they should acquire fullness of knowledge and that they should further strive after rectitude of life and perfect development, perfection of development. So fullness of knowledge, strive after rectitude of life and perfection of development. So he lists those things as like the umbrella. And then under that umbrella, he lists the 10 things. And then under those 10 things, he starts to flesh it out in discussing the liberal arts and the holy scriptures. Well, also number four is related to the fear of the Lord, but two and three are all about the Holy scriptures. And how to read them. And then four is about the fear of the Lord and our willingness to confront ourselves with the truth and like take in the truth and like our, I read that one as like our willingness to admit the truth, to sit with the truth. That last line in four is really powerful. We should remember that it is better and more comfortable to truth. Notice that he's like, he makes no mention of what's better, like more comfortable for us. What's more comfortable to truth, to believe what is written even if the sense remains concealed from us, then to hold that for true, which we are able to recognize by our own strengths. Do you, what do you hear him saying in that? Well, I first wanted to say that the word, um, what you are saying as comfortable is actually come formable. And I just Googled what that right. means. It's okay. Oh, but it's not. interesting because it does, it does change things, but yeah. it says disposed or accustomed to conform to what is acceptable or expected. Thank you for pointing that out. Okay. Say that again. Okay disposed or accustomed to conform to what is acceptable or expected. We should remember that it is better and more Okay. Yeah, go with it. Do the thing. Okay. This section, I do feel like connects with the previous section where he's calling out people who are basically that the Bible and the scripture has meaning inside of it. Not, it's not meant for us to interpret or to develop our own meaning. It is speaking a meaning and a truth. Mm. They assign, and he talks about specifically people who assign to what is read a meaning that does not belong to it. Yeah. And then you go forward to where you're, what you were bringing up. And I'm going to go actually a, a sentence before that. It says, therefore, we are not to raise any objection to the Holy Scriptures, either when we understand them and feel ourselves smitten by their words 
or when we do not understand them and give ourselves up to the thought that we can understand and grasp something better out of our own minds. And then you go to the next sentence and I wonder if he's like talking about, it's better for us to not project our judgments, like what you talk about, project all of our thoughts and feelings on what we want it to mean or what we think it means. And instead sit in our uncomfortableness, that place that you talked about, that you talk about of being in that place of, I don't remember what you called that, but it's in that tension of not fully understanding. Yeah. I just call it. And letting that be be okay. Okay. Well, I feel like that is the tension. Mm. We should remember that it is better and more conformable to truth. It's better just to, it's more truthful to believe what is written, even if the sense remain, remains concealed from us. We don't understand it. Yes. Oh. We can't grasp it. Then to hold that for true, which we are able to recognize by our own strength, by creating something that is more relevant or does seem to make sense of us so we can boast in it, our own understanding or our own creation. Right. Yeah, that's so hard. How do you guys do that? I don't know why I um, <clears throat> put on here as a note to this section, um, humility and imagination, um, that, uh, you know, reading, I think it's probably because, you know, this part where it says, even if the sense remains concealed from us, um, that that then to hold that for true which we are able to recognize by our own our own strength um you know i guess not just 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 accepting and trusting that what is said in the holy scripture scriptures is is true even if our senses does not tell us that it is because if we can go beyond our senses mm. meaning you know use also our imagination and trust it that um, that can also lead us to the truth with, with humility. If we, we are taking this with humility and reading the scriptures with humility and knowing and trusting that it is true, um, then Yeah, well, I think that's absolutely right. Humility, absolutely. And then I love the point you made about if we're going to do this thing where we're going beyond our own understanding, that means we have to access a different part of our being and the imagination. And then that connects to what it was saying, the mystical sense of words. I think, well, I could be imposing meaning on there, but what I want the mystical sense of words to mean is that that metaphorical, imaginative, um, I, I, I need to, I wonder what he means by mystical, but if he means like that imaginative thing, like it connects, he could mean, I wonder what he does mean by mystical. Does he mean like the, the anagogical that four levels of reading, do you think? Are you guys familiar with the four levels of reading? Okay. Well, Never heard that word before. Do you want to? Um, yeah. It applies here because I, I wonder if that's what he's talking about. So the four levels of reading are, um, well, I, I know them, literal, moral, allegorical, and anagogical. The literal is what's literally happening. 
the literal, you know, the, what the census can perceive, like, this is the story. This is literally what's happening. This person went to this location. They talked, they had this conversation. There were these clothes. These are the, the very literal things that were happening. Then the moral is, and this is actually a specifically a Christological way of reading. So it was applied specifically to scripture, but people like Angelina would actually say this applies to all stories. Like that's her idea of, um, of, uh, her monomyth theory is that all stories are telling the gospel story and it reflects back. I'm assuming I haven't actually talked about this with her, but I'm assuming she's getting it from this right here. Um, the literal sense is the meaning conveyed by the words of scripture, the actual person, event, place, or thing described in the biblical text. And if it was applied to literature, it would be the, the, the literal thing. The allegorical sense is how those persons, events, places, or things in the literal sense point to Christ and his work of redemption. Then the moral sense is how the literal sense points to the Christian's life in the church. And the anagogical sense, it's A-N-A-G-O-G, I-C-A-L is how the literal sense points to the Christian's heavenly destiny and the last things. So when he uses the term mystical, I'm curious if he's meaning one of those four senses, because he definitely would have been reading scripture using these four senses. I don't know. Well, I'm so glad that you just happened to be studying these things to give us like these behind the scenes details about who this Robinus Morris was and how he was thinking. The Catholic church has a lot of amazing things to say about how to read scripture. Like I was raised Protestant and um, I was taught that, well, I, I'm not going to go into what I was taught, but I was taught certain things that led me to be closed off from learning from Catholic saints or ideas. And I'm so glad that that's not the case in my life anymore. Um, even though I'm not Catholic, I'm really excited to learn. Like there's, yeah. So, um, I'm so grateful. They like the way they describe how to read is exactly how we learn how to read at Padea, all the other things. So they're specifically talking about scripture, but those things is just wisdom for how to read anything. Well, you're basically living out what he's talking about. We should be able to take things even from people that we don't necessarily say, well, I'm Catholic. Mm -hmm. We should be able to take the things that are true because they've been given to them and are true with whether they have communicated or, or someone else. Right. So you're living it out. Right. Avelina, did you grow up like learning how to read the Bible like this? Like <laughs> I actually did not start reading the Bible until I was an adult okay yeah so yeah I heard stories of the Bibles you know yeah. reading a church but as far as studying it and and reading it I not until I was an adult and probably and and I'm sure it's not the way that you're learning how to read scriptures right now <laughs> All right. Yeah, the way I was taught, well, yeah, it was different when I was growing up too. <laughs> now it's different, but um, okay. Um, all right, so anything else from these first few sections? Because we haven't even gotten into any of the liberal arts. I really, I just want to echo again. I really loved what you pulled out between the two of you, those three things at the bottom of page 251, top of page 250, 250, 251. They, she, he seems to list out three things, like the three errors of reading. Like that's what I saw in that. And it made me want to write them down as something to keep in mind as I'm listening to students and reading papers and that sort of thing. Cause I'm like, oh, this is what it would, these are, this is the way that errors and reading might show up. Um, but those who read superficially, so 
superficial reading looks like allows them um, they're allowing themselves to be deceived through the manifold recurring passages so they allow themselves to be deceived the sense of which is obscure and the meanings of which is doubtful they assign to what is read a meaning that does not belong to it one they seek errors where no errors are to be found two <laughs> And they surround themselves with an obscurity in which they cannot find the right path. I was like, gosh, you just described modernity. <laughs> I can't hear you. Oh, modern reading. Yes. Literally every college classroom. <laughs> Let's pretend the Odyssey is a feminist, but a, a, you know, something that we have to analyze from a feminist perspective, because obviously Homer's making a point about anti-feminist principles obviously i'm judging <laughs> you're you're muted <laughs> i do have to say that i want to go back to what you were talking about and how you learned to read the bible because i do feel like i was having a conversation about this with a friend on sunday evening and we are specific. She was specifically talking about a Bible study. And I do feel like that we've somewhat been trained in this modern way of thinking that it even overflows into our Bible. Well, it very much overflows into our Bible reading. And it really, I'm, I am just shocked by how much my thinking has been shaped by modernity. <laughs> really just especially yeah. even within the church and that it's not even an option like no alternative is really being given for how to even have a conversation about the word right right well yes i have a lot of in some places mm -hmm. you have to go searching for it when you're in a protestant church you have to find it's not just labeled as an option like it, it really isn't just laid out in front of you as a conversation or an option for your Bible study to look differently. So many questions have to do and so many questions that are presented in any type of modern Bible study are similar to this. Like, what does this mean to you? How does this affect the way that you live? And not that the, how it does, the scripture does affect how we live, but it also has its own meaning. Yeah. That there is inherent meaning without in. us inherent meaning. Yeah. Good job. Good word. Mm -hmm. Like what, what kind of questions are we asking ourselves to help us discern oh, what is it that this passage is actually saying and how yeah. would we come to know that? Right. And, and, and also in the context of who they are talking to, who, mm -hmm. who the audience is, is, was at the time and where they were um and what was happening when that scripture was written mm -hmm. does that make sense uh, yes it does like they listed that as the the this book is so helpful but it's they would make good principles for any literature class too but they say the book is the bible compass by edwards three sri but he says there's five keys to interpreting scripture correctly is the first one is to discover the author's intention. And in that he's talking about reading it according to its form. And, and he even goes into, if it's poetry, read it like poetry. If it's history, read it like history. Um, you know, and so he goes into the literary forms of the Bible in that section and saying that that's for to discover the author's intention, the first thing you do is to discover the genre and read it according to its nature. Yeah. Second is to be attentive to the unity of scripture. And then he's, in that he's talking about like the references um, for, and he used the example of the lion and the lamb reference in Revelation and how some people just mean think that means that God is fierce and gentle. And he was like, actually, that means something very specific. The lion refers to the royal lineage of Jude given to Judah and the lamb refers to the Passover and the sacrifice. So he's both king in that Jude 
you know, the Judah lineage and he is the sacrificial lamb that saves the firstborn, you know, but all of us. And so it was very specific. And so reading it and so knowing the references. And then the third was read scripture within the living tradition of the church. And so like, what do other people say about it? Like what has the early church fathers and the church say about it? And as what I'm thinking like crazily opposed to everything else everyone has said for 500 years or, you know, how does it, is it in that somehow? And then um, four is read scripture within the symphony of God's revelation. And that one, oh, I kind of forgot that one was, oh, that, um, that one He said in some, the, um, he's talking about using the analogy of faith and the analogy of faith is the coherence of truths of faith among themselves and within the whole plan of revelation. So like this inner harmony that you sense, which I thought was interesting. And here in Maris, when he was talking about music, that you don't want to listen to music if you're not connected to truth. I'm like, oh, that is so true. Oh my gosh, I do that. <laughs> And then the last key for uh, the key, the fifth key, he said was use the four senses of scripture, which is what I just described to you guys, the literal, those four things, but it's those five keys together to, to interpret scripture properly, according to the Catholic church. <laughs> that is so good. Thank you for sharing it. I, I want to get it. I feel like I need it. Can't you see the parallels to like, you know, it's talking specifically about scripture, but then we could make that each of those mean something in the literary world and in the historical world, like it applies in every area of study. It's like read things according to their nature. Come on, people. <laughs> so true. It's so true. This is, it just makes me happy. Mm. I just want to say about the all of the arts. I feel like he is calling Christians, the church, to be excellent, to grow into these things. And I think he actually says that if you're not growing, basically, that's part of the Christian life is to be learning and to be growing. But he's asking them to do and learn and live these arts It is the art which qualifies us to write and speak correctly. Like if we don't grow in grammar, grammar is a science which teach us to, teaches us to explain the poets and historians. Like we are not going to be the best Christians that we can be. Like we're not going to be speaking as best as we could be speaking. Mm -hmm. If we're not studying grammar and I feel like he's calling, he's calling the church, not only just, yeah, I do think he does specifically talk about in order to communicate the scripture. But again, going back to in order to care for ourselves and care for the welfare of others, in order to love other people, we have to grow in these things that have been classified for some as secular as things that are looked to be looked down upon and I just love that he's I feel like I want to get up and read this to everybody and say do you want to join our <laughs> classical education because it's not just for teachers it's yes. for all of us and especially those of us as believers for us all to be growing in these arts it just makes me happy yeah. And it just makes me like, excited. Come on, people, drink the Kool Aid. <laughs> <laughs> drink the wine. No Kool Aid, that's right. Drink the wine. <laughs> drink the wine. It's story, just such an end. Sorry. In <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's like such a good <laughs> invitation. Like, and that's the thing. He's not talking to educators in this. No. 
he's talking to Christian. Well, he's, he's talking, talking to specifically. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just such a beautiful invitation. Like this is for all of us. Yeah. What I really appreciate about his descriptions too, is how concise they are. He is the most concise reader I've writer I've read thus far in terms of giving definitions to the arts. And I'm like, oh, thank you. I appreciate you so much right now. <laughs> thank you for being clear <laughs> and saying it in like one sentence. Yeah. And I, and he, then I like how he put grammar, then rhetoric, and then dialectic. That makes sense. Because I feel that when I teach. And then I saw how he explained. I'm like, yes, well, that that's why. Like, I mean, I, you guys know, I feel like you start teaching grammar when you're a baby or teaching rhetoric when you're a child. Like it's, I mean, obviously not classical discourse in the sense that we teach it in a high school class, but in ways, yes. I don't know. I feel like my four-year-old does a lot of good <laughs> trying to convince and speaking with long eloquence ways to try to convince. Oh yeah. Indeed. Indeed. Hey, look at page 252. Okay. Okay. It's number six. It's halfway down. Rhetoric. And I feel like he is calling out. He is calling out we who have the truth, but we are not trained in rhetoric. Oh yeah. I felt that. That was so good. That was very strong. Who would have the courage to maintain that the defenders of truth should stand weaponless in the presence of falsehood? Mm -hmm. Like he likens us to being weaponless in a battle. Like we are unprepared and unskilled if we have not grown in the art of using secular discourse effectively yeah well, it's very must, strong there must have been people who were still needed to be persuaded that they ought to study the liberal arts i mean and I even once you're persuaded and you think it's a good idea that you still have to like actually study it and get better and grow mm -hmm. into the art right yeah. like the skills yeah, through rhetoric, anything is proved true or false. Yeah, I, and I, mm -hmm, because we talk at length about that in, in our class, um, the power of rhetoric, like how powerful it is to persuade someone and it, like how powerful it is. It's just really powerful. And some people question kind of like the gun debate, whether people should have something as powerful as a gun. Well, I think people refer to the rhetoric debate in the same way sometimes, like whether people, well, I don't think it's a, not in the same way because I think most people don't think about rhetoric, but there's an attitude towards rhetoric that it is always manipulative and bad in a lot of modern circles. Like you'll hear it in the way somebody responds to a politician. You might hear somebody say, well, that's just rhetoric. In other words, that's just manipulation. That's just meant to have power over me or manipulate me or get me to think a certain way. It's not authentic and it's not actually pointing towards truth in other words. And so I'm going to have my walls up and be defensive because I have to be because you might try to take advantage of me and my willingness to be led by you or your thoughts or whatever. But that there's something in rhetoric worthy of studying even with its power i wonder if it's because of the corruption of the meaning of the word also awesome. yeah there's a really good book uh, my favorite book on rhetoric is uh, office of assertion by scott Kreider, and he addresses that at length in his introduction it's a fantastic introduction to rhetoric we'll actually get into that a lot Actually, that's what pretty much the whole lecture is going to be about is rhetoric as an act of loving your neighbor um, in this next lecture for October in the fellowship. And then we'll be talking about the classical, yeah, um, classical rhetoric and the different forms 
of classical discourse, cl rhetorical discourse, but we're going to speak about it from exactly, we're going to talk about that tension, where that comes from, and then what does it look like to have a rhetoric that is led by love, where the true goal is to perceive truth and lead others to truth. And how do we think about the particulars of rhetoric? So we're not going to just talk about it on a theoretical level. We're going to talk about it particulars. Like when I write this part of the paragraph, how is that loving my neighbor? We'll talk about that. But yeah, and but also uh, to your point though, sorry, that was like a side, shameless self-promotion. Um, <laughs> uh, to your point, I think it began to get a bad rap because of the sophists in ancient Greece. And the people who did use it, used it to just make money and have power over people. And they didn't care about the truth and it hurt people. And so there was a lot of people like, no, this is wrong. You can't do that. And so they threw the baby out with the bathwater. We have four minutes. What other sections do you want to bring our attention to that stood out to you in our last few minutes? I was number seven dialectic, that first two sentences, dialectic is the science of the understanding, which fits us for investigations and definitions for explanations and for distinguishing the true from the false. It is the science of sciences. It teaches how to teach others. It teaches learning itself. In it, the reason marks and manifests itself according to its nature efforts and activities. It alone is capable of knowing. It not only will, but can lead others to knowledge. Its conclusions lead us to an apprehension of our being and of our origin, though we apprehend the origin and the activity of the good, the creator and creature. It teaches us to discover truth and to unmask falsehood. It teaches us to draw conclusions. It shows us what is valid in argument and what is not. It teaches us to recognize what is contrary to the nature of things. It teaches us to distinguish in controversy the true, the probable, and the wholly false. By means of this science, we are able to investigate everything with penetration, to determine its nature with certainty, to discuss it with circumspection. Preach. That was one sentence, by the way. <laughs> I was waiting for the period. It came at the end. <laughs> this is the science of learning and teaching. I think you could write an entire book just on this. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we could just talk just about that one paragraph. Mm -hmm. So good. So why do you think he had it as the, this way? Why, why is it grammar rhetoric and dialectic or or is it is it is there any significance to that or that's a good question um you know because we always see it as grammar and then wrestling through the grammar learn and then the rhetoric part you're expressing it I, I don't, my, based on how he's talked about grammar, my sense is that the way he talked about grammar flowed really naturally into how he talked about rhetoric, almost like it was like the natural extension of it. And I think he might even say something similar, but, or it may not have significance. I don't actually know if it has significance to him in the order in which he just like named them. I don't know that, mm -hmm. but I do think that based on how it was written, there seems to be a natural flow from grammar to rhetoric in terms of how he talked about language. That's all I have. Bethany, do you have any insight on that? I don't have any insight. 
I'd like to think that he did it on purpose, though, because I feel like people who are writing something important and putting it down in paper, they were really thinking. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> when I say um, I don't know if it had significance, I meant like, I don't know if that's the order in which he taught it in school. Oh, well, isn't it the idea that they probably didn't, did, do you think that they actually, or did they actually teach them like separate? In my mind, I see all of these things so much just exactly at, at the same like integrated yeah. yeah they weren't subjects no they weren't subjects or at grades or whatever I think the la language arts grew in dynamics like the dynamics that I mean that's what I I mean I'm basing Pade off of that assumption so I hope that's <laughs> what I <laughs> I'm gonna oh, you're doing great I'm gonna say that's how you do it <laughs> we don't have really separate classes <laughs> yeah okay I Ooh. I think we could unpack I'm excited I want to unpack more the dialectic thing about teaching that makes me so happy to read that I mean it just brings it, me joy to read it well you know what it reminds me of what? is Xenophon and talking about Socrates mm -hmm. oh and Remember how much we learned about his ways of teaching and how someone learns mm. through those conversations and oh. through following those, that yeah. process. Yes. Oh, that's At really, least, sorry. That, and that's just what it reminded me when I read that. I was like, oh, it teaches how to teach others. It teaches learning itself. Mm-hmm. It yeah. reminded me of that conversation in Xenophon. Well, and you know, um, the in the fellowship where we talk about the journey of the student, the first meeting, developing friendship, and the uh, um, the flourishing friendship. That's based off the three mental uh, processes in the mind that are taught in traditional logic. And so the that whole. Like, I just see them as the same. That's how I can. You are a wealth of goodness to us. <laughs> I love the metaphor. Good well, job with I your images. I started trying to just teach that and it didn't go over very well. So I'm like, I need a metaphor. Like years ago, when I first started playing with that, I was like, this is it. I, I led with that in my lesson. Now I just like abandoned it. I haven't abandoned it, but I don't even really bring it up. <laughs> but people just absorb it now. Stories and metaphors are the language of our soul, mm -hmm. the food for our soul. So we need it that way. Yes. Good job. I know I need it that way. <laughs> I'm like, tell me a story. <laughs> it's so true. Hey, I just want to say one last thing. And it says, Abraham brought arithmetic and astronomy to the Egyptians. I know. I was so excited about that. And then look who creates the other sciences. The Egyptians. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. If you like that, you'll love this book called Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic Asi Asiatic roots of classical civilization. And also just read Herodotus because uh, he also talks about what the Greeks got from the Egyptians and that as well. Fantastic. Oh, she's like, let me pull it off my shelf. Check. Got it. Yes. There we go. <laughs> All right. All right. Any final thoughts? It is 934. Well, my time. I'm done with this, but once you stop recording, I just have something to say. Sure. Okay. All right. Well, I'll stop recording until next time, everyone. So next time we will be reading um, Martin Luther.
um, from to the councilmen of all cities in Germany. So that will be our reading for next time. So until next time, farewell.